but I'm still going to welcome you to uh, this Columbus Day, Indigenous Peoples Day, Canadian Thanksgiving Day. Um, the picture I wanted to show you was of uh, an, an artistic impression of Samuel de Champlain in 1608, uh, having a party with local uh, Indians and people bringing in lots of um, turkey, ham, and uh, uh, potatoes, etc., uh, in their best uh, clothes, and it was it was rather amusing because that would have died, I think, in early French Canada or what they call Lower Canada, had it not been for the United Empire loyalists who crossed the loyal to the crown and crossed the Niagara frontier after the American Revolution and brought to Toronto and the Niagara frontier the American interest in Thanksgiving. And then the Canadians spent a long time battering around a suitable date. And they did not come up with this until with the, with the date, which we now have the second Monday in October until 1957, it was passed in Canadian parliament. So just for your information, uh, that's why for me, having grown up in Ontario, I find uh, uh, this, uh, I keep forgetting that it's Columbus Day and think it's Canadian Thanksgiving still. Anyway, I welcome you all and we should acknowledge as the president has this morning and several announcements over the weekend uh, uh, honoring Indigenous Peoples Day as well because they are considered the original environmentalists. Um, our speaker today, as you undoubtedly know now from uh, seeing uh, some of these images is uh, Tony Praza. Tony has been my right-hand man for many years since this uh, uh, chapter started in 2010. Uh, he has spoken to us about a variety of topics, how green some uh, companies are. He's talked about um, um, uh, various economic aspects and uh, a, a bit about recycling. Um, I'm trying to think of some of the other topics. I was thinking of them the other day, but anyway, he's, he's covered a, a wide range of interesting topics and I appreciate that. Uh, and today he's filling in for the fact that uh, COVID has precluded our, uh, our um, usual field trip that we take because the bank is closed and we used to meet at the bank and got embarrassed a few years ago by forgetting that the bank was closed when we had a speaker from Virginia. So, so we decided to avoid future problems by always having field trips on Columbus Day. And um, so Tony is filling in for our inability to go there with a, a topic that I think is becoming more and more important. And he has some great uh, videos to show us. So Tony, uh, thank you, you have the floor. Oh, thank you very much, Richard. Let's see, uh, first off, good morning to everybody. Uh, if you have questions, feel free to use the chat. I'm not sure if you can uh, interject as far as audio, but anytime I, when I got something going, if you'd like me to answer a specific question, I'd be more than willing to do that. Richard, if you do see anything on chat, if you would bring it to my attention, sure would appreciate it. I'll check it regularly, thanks. Very good, thank you. Let's see, uh, so as far as uh, a, a brief indication of what we're going to be covering today. <clears throat> so one of the uh, key elements as far as um, waste that we're generating throughout the world right now is combination of uh, world population where it's going and consumption and where that's going. Uh, and unfortunately the two of them coming together is gonna present some real challenges. Uh, now, some of those challenges are being worked on in various areas across the world. We'll touch on uh, a, a very basic approach towards the, the three R's and a little bit more about the three R's and how many companies are using that and individuals are using that concept. Uh, then also associated with companies, the uh, concept of cradle to cradle. And we'll get into the converse of that and some of the issues it brings up. Next, as far as... Um, Recycling uh, spent fuel rods, only sp we'll spend a second or two on that. And then we'll go into uh, the end of trash, National Geographic's March edition uh, 2020. And uh, it's available online, I think open to anybody. Uh, the link uh, at a point in time in the future, if you wanted to go to National Geographic and look it up, you'll be able to get it. Uh, on the other hand, if there's an interest, I can create this 
PowerPoint presentation into a PDF. And as you go through that PDF on your own computer, you could be clicking on the various links like I will be doing in certain areas. And you'll be able to get to the same information that I'm looking at, including the video. Uh, the audio that I'll be doing, you would not be able to get to it unless you are a um, uh, subscriber to um, uh, Libby, which is available through the library where I get my audio books. Uh, and then if you waited to get the particular audio that I'm running, you'd be able to actually listen to that full book. Uh, next thing, as far as um, the past and current state of recycling, uh, various issues, I'll touch on that near the beginning and also, of course, uh, as we go through the process. Uh, there are definitely many challenges out there associated with, uh, with uh, recycling. Uh, uh, how uh, recycling came became a nationwide program. Uh, I'll run, a, a, I probably won't run that audio uh, as far as the NPR, but I'll, I'll point you to that particular one. Uh, it's actually two segments uh, and it's, it's got an interesting background, uh, but it also is a little bit conflicted in relationship to what Madison recycling routes appear to have been at some point in time in the past, which we'll also touch on. And then recycling around uh, Madison, uh, we'll, we'll touch on several different things that are going on. Uh, you'll see that both at the beginning and at the end. And then uh, last one is, uh, I, I watched a video not too long ago, and I thought it was apropos. Uh, this happens to be the just the trailer. I think it's a couple minutes long. Uh, and it's uh, Kiss the Ground, uh, which I think uh, sends a appropriate message and would be very beneficial if you shared that with farmers that you know. So. With that, let me continue on. So I stole this slide from the last uh, presentation uh, as indicated there. Uh, and uh, it, it, it presents a very key element and that is the world of course has existed for well over four, 4 billion years. It went through quite a bit of evolution in the first so uh, half, a million, half a billion years or so. Uh, but after it started stabilizing, and it, it did go through some other dramatic changes as we went through the um, various cycles. But one of the key elements that she touched on, of course, was that it, it constantly was recycling and it continues to recycle. Uh, unfortunately, some of the things that we're doing to it uh, takes a lot longer for it to absorb and uh, really address the, the critical factors associated with the way we exist now and sustaining that for a long period of time going into the future, which pathways to the sustainable planet, that's what we're all about. And unfortunately at this point in time, it's not something that the world is perceiving as a critical issue. Uh, yes, some people are working on sustainability, don't get me wrong. Uh, there's lots of good work that the um, UN is doing associated with that. And universities will touch on that also. Uh, but there are so many challenges out there, as we'll see uh, as we go through that, and then probably as you are experiencing. So world population, uh, this chart just kind of shows you the growth over the last 12,000 years. And a couple of key points, and that is uh, along about 1600s, we're approximately half a billion people in, throughout the world. Uh, it took a couple hundred years to double that to uh, 1 billion people in the 1800s. Uh, then as you look at what happened around the 1920s, uh, sure, we had a lot of issues happening as far as the economy. The world also was growing very quick because we got up to 2 billion, uh, 2 billion people. And of course, right now, we're a lot more than that too, and we'll be touching on that here shortly. So the audio I'm going to run uh, is Jared Diamond's Upheaval. It's had some mixed reviews as far as some of the accuracy in it, but I, I definitely feel that it's a very well done and several other critics out there indicate that it's quite, quite well done. And I'll, I'll just touch on one of the uh, sections of it associated with that, that video. So bear with me for a second. by the entire factor of 32. So did everybody hear that uh, by the factor of 32, Richard? 
I did. Thank you. Yep. Is everybody dream of achieving a first world lifestyle possible? Consider the numbers. Multiply current national numbers of people by national per capita consumption rates of oil, metals, water, etc. for each country and add up those products over the whole world. The resulting sum is the current world consumption rate of that resource. Now repeat that calculation, but with all developing countries achieving a first world consumption rate up to 32 times higher than their current ones, and no change in national populations or in anything else about the world. The result is that world consumption rates will increase by 11-fold. That's equivalent to a world population of about 80 billion people with the present distribution of per capita consumption rates. There are some optimists who claim that we can support a world with 9.5 billion people, but I haven't met any optimist mad enough to claim that we can support a world with the equivalent of 80 billion people. Yet we promise developing countries that, if they will only adopt good policies like honest government and free market economies, they too can become like the first world today. That promise is utterly impossible, a cruel hoax. So as... That book recaps just that one section of it. Uh, we're well over seven and a half billion people uh, in the world at, the, at this point in time. Right now, the projection is by 2050, uh, it's predicted that uh, we'll have nine and a half billion people. I'm not sure how over the next oh, 50 years, we're gonna level off at 10 billion, but that's what a lot of people think that the uh, world will be somewhere around 10, 10 billion. Uh, but in any case, as the audio that we just listened to, just hold for a minute, actually, that first world lifestyle, uh, it's just not working for every everybody at this point in time. And if you get the U.S., Europe, Japan, and some other countries that are that do have that first world uh, lifestyle, and if you roll that out across the rest of the world, um, seven and a half. Right now, billion people. It means that we'll be using up about eighty billion, re, uh, you know, resources. And uh, in the book, it touches on you know energy and other things that are uh, impacted by our utilization and how can we sustain that. And not only how can we sustain that, what can we do with all that material? Could I ask a question, Tony? Sure. Um, I want to make sure that I understood this and that everybody understood it. As I understand it, uh, Jared got to 32 billion, uh, 80 billion, I think, by multiplying 32 fold um, on, the, on the assumption that that's how much it would go, the factor that we, our population would go up by equivalently if everybody in the world lived to the lifestyle of North America and Europe. Is that your right. interpretation? Yes, that's my interpretation. He goes into a little bit more detail in the book. Uh, what he indicates, of course, is that there's about a billion people right now, one billion people that already have that first world lifestyle. Yes. And it's the other six and a half billion. Uh, and then uh, as he goes through that, he equates that through some analysis that that would equal 11 times if everybody was doing it. But, but he, I think he, that he, enters into his calculation. But, but he makes the statement that we promised the rest of the world that they could live according to our lifestyle. Who made that promise? I'm not aware of any promise like that. Yeah, the, if you look at the UN's uh, uh, pathways to, and I'm not, it's not pathways sustainable, but they have a program. I think it's got like 19 different objectives uh, at, at the UN. It's also available online. I touched on it uh, in a presentation years ago. Okay. Um, that does talk about, you know, this is the way that we get to a world that is sustainable for the long term. Uh, and it talks, talks about, you know, first world lifestyles for everybody, uh, basically not using and consuming what we're doing right now because there's other factors associated with getting there. And, and some of those other factors are going to be a challenge to get to. Yet all of those people are, in many cases, trying to, um, let's say, uh, 
come across borders into other countries where the lifestyle is much better for various reasons. Uh, and of course, over time, they themselves and their families grow up in that environment and they then uh, start materializing as far as that. Those borders are gonna be very challenging to maintain if we continue to go down the path. And I won't, I won't get into that detail. That's a whole different subject, that's for sure. I won't, I won't take you for a long time, just one other quick, quick comment. It seems sure. to me like that's an implied promise, not made by one individual, but by the United Nations. But it seems to be, from what you're just saying, uh, a promise that's very much taken literally by um, uh, immigrants who demand access uh, to us, uh, particularly across the Mediterranean and across the Mexican border, and feel insulted and abused by not being uh, uh, accepted readily. I agree, definitely. Okay, thank you. Okay, go so ahead. Here's uh, uh, the top 25 countries around the world that are recycling municipal solid waste. And you'll notice on the far left-hand side is, uh, let's see if I can zoom in on it a little bit more. Looks like Germany. Germany is, yep. Sorry about that. Singapore. Uh, Germany uh, at, the, at the far left, uh, over 65%. And then if you go all the way through that chart and you look at the far right-hand side, the U.S. is down there around 35%. Yeah, we're at the bottom. Yep. Now, this study was done a few <laughs> years ago. Yeah. yeah. Now, there are other countries that are doing worse than us, don't get me wrong. But there are many <laughs> countries in between that are doing a lot better than we are, of course, with Germany leading it. Now, there are some countries also that um, the way they calculate uh, their recycling, they include, uh, like Sweden, uh, much of their energy and electricity is generated through um, uh, their um, central locations in large cities where they use the um, wood chips, I believe, and other materials uh, very heavily. And they're using that in their recycler program. That does not calculate into this uh, particular calculation. This is what would go to landfill from homes and or companies, I believe, and would be in, in, in a uh, solid waste system. How so would you Germany consider wood way. chips? How would you consider wood chips recycling? It's an, it's the most tragic thing that we do on this planet, in my opinion, mm -hmm. as a recyclable energy. How does that qualify as a recycling? I don't. I, you have to be, talk to people in Sweden about that. Although I visited Sweden, I did not have the opportunity to ask anybody of knowledge that <laughs> uh, how they do that. So, it, it, but it's that's, less, that's my impression of it. Less controlled than burning coal. The emissions are terrible from wood chips. Yeah, I, I do think they do a reasonably good job of capturing that. I, I'm not sure if the, it's a carbon capture or just the process. Uh, I, I, I have a fireplace. Uh, we used it for a period of time. It is highly efficient, right in the range of our, uh, it is a self-contained fireplace. All the wood is burned uh, and um, the outside air uh, coming comes from the outside to go through that. Uh, I don't use it as frequently as I did when we first got it. So. Okay, no comment, go ahead. Right. So uh, this is a fairly lengthy video, but I'm hoping that you'll appreciate it. Uh, as we go through it, I'll, I'll maybe touch on a couple of uh, key elements. Um, Before we talk about tax smart investing, it's new. Audrey's expecting twins. Maybe closer to the twins. Change in plans. At Fidelity, a change in plans is always part of the plan. Plastic pollution remains a global threat to our lands and seas. And since World War II, we have created over 9 billion cubic tons of it. But the recycling of it remains limited. Miles O'Brien looks at new ideas and innovations that may enable better recycling in the future. It's part of our Breakthrough series. Now, part of the reason for running this video is it features, as you'll see in a couple places, both pelletary waste uh, systems that we were going to take a tour if we had gone to that particular location. Uh, really, one of the reasons we didn't go to that location is, is they only have two available slots for the cars to come in normally when they have uh, 
Uh, and, and we would only had eight people go on that tour. Plus we were in close co contact with each other for a, a longer period of time driving over there and back. So uh, they also indicated that they'd uh, rather hold off sometime in the future. If there is an interest at some point in time, we'll take a look at possibly going there. Imagine what it would be like to live without plastic. Do you want to help us put the coffee grounds in the compost? Christy Twist is determined to make it a reality for her family, daughter Ava, and husband Max Del Ferro. My ultimate goal... Later, we'll also touch on a third-party service that facilitates in the Madison area uh, the ability of what she's doing there currently is recycling her uh, compost. Is to not have a trash can or a recycling bin. That's my goal. I'm far from it, but that's what I want. An engineer by profession, she showed me how she has re-engineered life at their Chicago home. I made this mask out of an old bed sheet that had a hole in it. I needed baking chocolate, so I chose chocolate wrapped in paper that I could compost as opposed to chocolate in a plastic wrapper. So we've got a ton of bread, which yeah. comes in plastic, which is unfortunate. Yeah. But sometimes I'm able to find it in paper. And if I'm ever able to find it in paper, I'll always do that instead. You know, we'll make broth or, or save things in the freezer mm -hmm. in glass jars. Christy uses an expensive private recycling service because she knows municipal methods offer no assurance the plastic she uses will be recycled especially since China stopped accepting and supposedly recycling our plastic trash a few years ago. Just sorting it all out is a big challenge. At Pelletary Waste Systems in Madison, Wisconsin, they use conveyors, gravity, air jets, magnets, eddy currents, robots, and humans to divide the contents of recycling bins. They separate, bale, and sell 95% of the plastic that comes through here. But according to the Environmental Protection Agency, less than 9% of all the plastics produced ever get recycled in the U.S. Drink bottles and milk jugs, labeled number one and number two, are most likely to be recycled. But the vast majority is eventually either landfilled or burned. Why? Well, plastics are varied and complex. Now, I'll restate something. I believe they said earlier on, 95% uh, of Pelletary's recycled material, they have customers to accommodate that. And they say they here locally in the Madison area, uh, they are not having issues like some other con uh, countries and location cities where they've stopped recycling, unfortunately. They're sending it to landfill. In our case, the recycle that goes to Pelletary, of which they do an excellent job, uh, is uh, handled appropriately and they've got customers for it. And most cannot simply be melted down and reused. So here is some of the virgin plastics that, that you can manufacture. George Huber is a professor of chemical engineering at the University of Wisconsin. Now, of course, you mentioned University of Wisconsin right here in Madison. Uh, these are plastics that are more difficult to recycle uh, and some of the plastics that we're currently recycling, the combination of them, uh, they've got different processes they're using in the labs right now to come up with a better method of uh, reusing these materials. He showed me just some of the hundreds of plastics on the market. All of them derived from crude oil or natural gas. So right here, this is linear low density polyethylene, LDPE. This is ultra low density polyethylene. Food packages frequently contain as many as 20 different layers of chemically distinct plastic formulations to maintain freshness, rigidity, and imprint labels. You cannot recycle this. All of this right now will go to landfill. There's no technology that's used to recycle something this complicated today. And that's what you're working on here. And we are developing a technology to recycle this. He is looking for environmentally friendly solvents to chemically reduce plastics or polymers to their constituent chemicals, fossil fuel. We can use different solvents to selectively remove each of the individual components in the plastics. With chemical recycling, you're remaking the polymer. It is identical, has all the exact properties as the virgin polymer, as the virgin plastic. 
There's no change at all. He and his team are also working on a technique called pyrolysis, where plastic is cooked in a furnace. It's kind of like a campfire when you put plastics in your campfire and it, your plastics heat up and you see those fumes coming from your plastic. The same thing is happening in here. Just we're not adding any oxygen so you don't burn them. In this case, they're turning. Which, of course, is a key element. If you're burning that plastic, you'll generate CO2, but if you're not injecting oxygen into the process, no CO2 is generated, of course. Turning polyethylene plastic back into crude oil. So you could use in your car to make gasoline, diesel fuel, um, but I think the most valuable use of this oil will be to make other plastics. This addresses one of the other problems with traditional or mechanical recycling methods. The finished products often don't measure up to the virgin material. As a result, pyrolysis and chemical recycling ideas have caught the attention of the plastics industry. The Saudi Basic Industries Corporation, or SABIC, is building a commercial plant in the Netherlands designed to chemically recycle plastic waste. Bob Mahan is the Chief Technology and Sustainability Officer. That facility that we're constructing now is already committed in terms of volume uh, before we've even had it constructed. So I think it gives you a sense of what the engagement uh, is like in the value chain today. Did that surprise you a little bit that there, there was that kind of demand? It doesn't surprise me today, but I think if you would ask me that question five years ago, I think we would have gotten a different answer. Still, advanced chemical recycling is not the sole answer to the plastic waste crisis. Improving existing recycling technology is also important. This is the polymer engineering lab. Tim Oswald is a professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Wisconsin. His lab is filled with equipment designed to process and evaluate the performance of plastic polymers. He's trying to refine the traditional approach, creating new ways to identify and isolate specific types of plastic. So just as a blanket statement, it is possible to make recycled plastic as good as new. Yes. But that's a bit of a problem? It's a bit of a problem. I mean, <clears throat> obviously, we have to uh, clean them. We have to separate them. We have to make sure that uh, you have the same type of that material. That's technology that we're working on. But as long as people view plastics as cheap and disposable, recycling will face an uphill challenge. I think it's going to take a major mindset shift um, to see fossil fuels and plastic, which comes from fossil fuels, as a limited and precious resource that we need to think so carefully about how we're using it and how we're disposing of it. And remember Christie's husband, Max Del Ferro? He is a chemist at Argonne National Laboratory working on advanced plastic recycling techniques. His lab is developing a process called hydrogenolysis to chemically recycle plastic, including bubble wrap. The chemical structure of this product from, from the bubble wrap has the same structure of the synthetic lubricants that you find on, on the market. So I'm never going to look at a plastic bag the same again. Do you, or do you look at them differently now? Uh, I see an opportunity. Yeah. It's, there is... There is already a lot of talking, for example, to do urban mining. Urban mining. Imagine that. An oil patch in a landfill. Now there's a solution that will play well on the home front. For the PBS NewsHour, I'm Miles O'Brien in Chicago. <laughs>
so I'm not going to go into too much detail here on that. But in many companies that are focused in on doing a better job of recycling, uh, of which I've had an opportunity to work with a couple, uh, one I did not work with but has done an excellent job uh, is uh, the um, auto manufacturer Subaru. They send zero waste to the landfill. None of their uh, material going through their plant is uh, sent to the landfill. Uh, they, they've done an excellent job at their facilities. I know one down in Indiana that I, I came across a while back. Um, in, in reaching those objectives, uh, part of it, the items that are on this list of, of the additional thoughts of reuse is first off, refusing. <clears throat> Uh, when you go into a grocery store and someone uh, you're buying a single item that you can easily car carry out, more often than not, they'll still offer you a bag. But if you can carry that item or a couple more without a bag, there's no reason that you should be, of course, uh, taking a bag from them. Or better yet, bring your own bags in and, and use those. You know, Rethinking uh, the item that you're looking to purchase. Do you have something that can do the job right now or can uh, uh, see things through? Uh, uh, several of these are, are more frequently thought in relationship to the businesses are concerned. Uh, when you have an item, uh, resetting it, similar going back to the basics, uh, reset the thoughts of far as why, why you're using a particular item. Uh, consider something else, uh, redesigning it, again, more in, in the uh, manufacturing area. Uh, online purchases, no doubt about it. Uh, it it's, it's overall, it's reducing the amount of uh, driving that consumers are doing when they go out to shop for items. And so often when people go out to shop for them, they're not looking to buy, they're just looking in many cases. Uh, so what you should be doing is looking online, buying it online if possible. And if you do go to the grocery store or wherever you're going, when you do do that, uh, make sure you're going to buy those particular items with that in mind. So, uh, there are some questions, Tony. Do, do you want to answer a few of them now? Sure, definitely. It'd be fine. Okay. We have four. Uh, Alan um, Pentakoff asks the panelists and the attendees, or he just makes a statement, I think, as incomes rise, generally birth rates fall. So overall, the population increase may slow as people come into first world lifestyle. Still, of course, this is a lot of consumption. So that, that's a statement. Um, Doug Edwards asks a question, I suppose, but I don't know, that they assume, I suppose in Sweden, the burned wood is captured by the next year's uptake of CO2 to produce another tree ring or a newly planted tree. And my answer to that question, I don't know if you have any on, on that, Tony, but, um, Bill Gates responds to that question. We'll have that in his talk. Do you have any thoughts on that? I, I, I don't know the exact percentages and how well it, uh, that tree recaptures the wood that's been burned, but uh, Doug brings up a very good point. And most of what they're bringing is, is definitely they're recycling those, those um, forests in a very effective manner. We do a pretty good job in the middle of Wisconsin with the um, indigenous speak, people that are up there, Menominee, I believe it is, where they do an excellent job of recycling in their particular forest. Uh, and that more of that recycling in forests is happening across the world. Unfortunately, the, the amount of uh, recycling we're doing in, in harvesting and replanting uh, trees, I don't know that it's keeping up with all the other, you know, I, I know it's not keeping up with all the other things. <clears throat> let me, let me make to... a comment about, I'm not sure about Sweden, but I know Germany uh, cannot keep up with their renewable uh, promises with wind and solar. They just can't do it as uh, much as they had thought they would. And so fortunately, they allowed biofuels to be considered a renewable energy source. And so they can make up what they, their shortfall with wind and solar with vast amounts of <coughs> wood chips, which they buy transatlantic from Brazil, United States, and Canada. And they have these wood chips shipped across uh, the Atlantic Ocean and, and sometimes through the Panama Canal because a lot of the forests are, are on the Pacific coast. And so there's huge shipments of wood chips. And, and that's what really ticks me off about uh, recycling. I, I, I hope that is never considered recycling. If so, it's a tragedy and a terrible use of the word. 
Uh, on that first chat item that you had, uh, <clears throat> there is a, an overall balance that's happening with uh, population as a whole and consumption. Uh, definitely the U.S. is, uh, my impression is, is on average, we're reducing our consumption uh, in, in many areas across the country. People like the one that was shown in Chicago, more people are embracing a better approach towards consumerism. <clears throat> on the, and what we're doing with uh, uh, electric vehicles and other methods, that consumption is, is getting reduced, my understanding of it. Uh, but as the population grows, yes, it's growing at a slower rate. If you look at population growth over the last, oh, gee, uh, 100 years or more, it's gone from around 2% in some countries as high as 4%. But on, on average, the world is around 1% right now, which, and it's, it's been dropping consistently in relationship to percentage of uh, new inhabitants on the world. Uh, our average life, uh, fortunately, is growing that we're sitting around this table now and on the Zoom, uh, being able to uh, live a longer life on average. Uh, and that's also a factor associated with the, the calculation as far as going forward. So, any other questions, Richard? Yeah, there are uh, three more. Uh, two from uh, Mike Green. Uh, the, the first one is a toughie. Any idea? Oh, uh, how bad is the problem of contaminating plastics in our recycling container with unlabeled or un unnumbered plastics? I'm not sure how to answer that. Do you? <clears throat> no. Uh, first off, my impression is the. <clears throat> Only plastic you should be recycling are those that are numbered. Yeah. Uh, and I, I know one video I looked at, it's questionable whether you should ever recycle a peanut, uh, peanut butter plastic. It's better to buy peanut butter in a glass. It's easier to get out. First off, um, <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, the amount of, bear, bear with me. Yeah, the amount of peanut butter residual in a plastic, I've had that problem. You have to get a spatula and yeah. really work at it and then use soap and water. So you're going through hot water. Yeah. Plus uh, the, that plastic and the, and the ability to recycle it, it's not as cost effective as glass is. Glass, there's yeah. definitely, you want to reuse it. You definitely want to clean it up, put it in. Uh, cans, uh, tin cans, aluminum cans, you want to rinse them out and recycle those. Of course, newspaper, paper, just about any kind of paper. Uh, I will be pointing you to a, a website uh, uh, at Palatella Terry that uh, indicates uh, most, if not all, of the items uh, that are there. There's like 20 videos I've watched. Most of them, I, probably 15. I think there's a couple I didn't get a chance to watch. Uh, but they definitely do a very good job here locally in, in relationship to doing it. And they do most of the municipalities around Madison area. Okay, the second question, any idea why Woodman's, at least on the west side, no longer accepts plastic bags for recycling? Yeah, that is a, a difficult item to recycle. I recycle most of mine at Target, and I'm not sure how well Target as a nationwide organization has that set up. But I will continue to do that and take them back to whenever I, 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 I don't make a special trip. It's whenever I happen to be going to Target or in that area that I'll take the bags with me and, and recycle them there. And I know some other grocery stores still recycle. Okay. A comment from George Erickson. He says, we usually replant with a monoculture, which is death to many species. Yeah. So he's, he's making a, a point about uh, wood chips and re recycling them. Um, replanting yep. for us. Doug Edwards, yeah. good point, George. Doug Edwards, uh, to both panelists and attendees, says, to make biofuels, or wood chips for that matter, sustainable as a source of energy, it's necessary to regrow as much as is harvested each year. I don't know the current balance. Yeah, nobody really, I think, knows that. It comes from three countries, and no, but they're not reporting. Mm -hmm. um, and, and a cute one from Alan, the best way to clean out a peanut butter jar is give it to a dog. <laughs> <laughs> I would agree with them. Uh, we have a dog over the last couple of years before COVID and uh, she loves peanut butter, no doubt about it. Yeah. And uh, finally, a thought uh, from Plato Information, St. Vinny's is always in need of bag donations. They take bags of any size, plastic or paper. Uh, very good. Okay, yeah. move on. All right, thank you. 
Yeah, I guess touching on the last couple items, uh, one of which is uh, stager purchases. Uh, whenever you're going out uh, to take a walk, uh, consider before you go for that walk, uh, that's when you should do your uh, shopping in that general area. And, and then you get an opportunity to, to walk in other areas around the town or bike or whatever. So, so cradle to, to cradle, not cradle to grave. Uh, there's a, a book out, it uh, doesn't have chapters, doesn't have uh, breaks. You, you can pick it up at the library, cradle to cradle. Uh, it, it is definitely a different concept. Uh, and I, I would suggest to you that, um, uh, you know, if, if everybody had that concept firmly in place in manufacturing, uh, we'd be a lot further off and a lot, lot further along than, than we are at this point in time. Uh, some companies take it to heart and uh, looking at it, uh, but I would suggest to you very few. It's, uh, and, and years ago, uh, when I was uh, an engineer, ma ma manufacturing engineer, and mechanical focus, uh, we built products in such a way that they were serviceable. Uh, recently, um, uh, the president asked specifically that more companies should be building products that are serviceable, serviceable and not throwaway. When you think of uh, the technology and what's been happening with that technology and cell phones and computers and uh, the life cycle of those and the length of time uh, that they're around, most of those at least are getting recycled as long as the consumer is doing a good job of, of focusing on getting those recycled. So, But it's much better if we do it in such a way that we build them in such a way that they can be reused and recycled effectively when they're disposed. Um, Touching just another, very, just another sure, quick question. Mike Green says, asks, do you have or can you post links to the various pelletary videos that concern plastics? Could yes, you... I do. And, and, and uh, I, I definitely will, at least if nothing else, give you that particular link, Richard, if you wouldn't mind sending it out to everybody. I will. Good. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So this next one, I'll only touch briefly on uh, recycling uh, spent fuels. Fourth generation uh, technology is expected, uh, as far as nuclear technology is expected to have that capability. I sure hope that it's built into design. I think that's a critical factor, along with the concept of possibly putting a fourth generation uh, nuclear power plant right next to the power plants that we have right now to reuse those spent fuels. Whether that's practical or not, I'm not well-versed enough to know that. I do know that France does an excellent job of recycling it, and they get a lot more use out of those pellets than the 5% that the current process of uh, nuclear plants do. They're, they recycle it, and they do a much better job. And of course, it it's, uh, has a short, shorter lifespan once it's been recycled effectively. So, Can I make a comment there? Of course, I thought you would. Yeah. Well, uh, fourth generation power plants come in six flavors, only one of which is shown in your figure. But you picked the best one. And the reason is there are no pellets there at all. Uh, the only, those rods that you see, those vertical rods are, are nothing to do with fuel. Those are the cooling uh, rods of um, uh, graphite, but the fuel is dissolved uh, the uranium fuel or, or thorium fuel is dissolved in uh, a molten salt, either chloride or fluoride salt. So there are no pellets, period. And there's no uh, zirconium um, rods to, to enclose the uranium oxide. It's all missing. And the beauty of it is that you can pull off xenon gas uh, right off the top and you can, um, as, as a gas, which is inhibitory to future uh, uh, fission, so it has huge advantages over the other five families. And that's something that uh, um, perhaps wasn't clear enough from um, uh, Robert Hargrave's lecture because he's, a, he's one of the uh, pioneers and founders of Thorcon. But it, it's a, it's a bit, and, and people are so excited about these pebble bed reactors um, that are made of pellets. Those are very safe, but um, be, because they're all very enclosed and doubly enclosed in various layers of ceramics, but they're awfully hard to recycle uh -huh. and costly. And so I think that of all the families, the molten salt reactor has some enormous advantages. Uh, people worry about uh, corrosion of the tubing with, uh, with uh, uh, hot salts, 
but uh, I think they've gotten around that quite well with some of the advances in metallurgy. And I think it's overblown uh, for people who are negative about it. So I think that, and the Chinese of course have been given all this information and they're building them right now. So we'll see how China works since our nuclear regulatory commission is too slow and too expensive to, to do very much and has been very uh, detrimental to advances in this country. Uh, maybe the Chinese can show us uh, what we started. Uh, but anyway, yeah, I'm not sure of all the variations in China, but I, my last I heard was they had well over 20 nuclear plants in the process of being built. Yeah, I think I think some of them are the old style, but uh, but they're working on on the molten salt ones. So I don't know that they have any of them up and running yet. But anyway, you showed a really good recycling one, uh, Tony. So thanks. That was the ideal. But right, don't don't welcome. think there are any pellets in there. They're all dissolved. <laughs> all right. Very good. Okay, so uh, the end of trash, National Geographic, March 2020, excellent article. Uh, and uh, again, uh, when I looked at it a while back, it was all available online to anybody. Uh, might need to pick up the, that particular uh, periodical at the library or whatever. Uh, but I, I, or if you uh, subscribe, uh, National Geographic is a real deal. It's only 15, I think it's like $15 and change for an annual subscription. Plus, you're able to go back and look at any any articles that they've posted in the past. So I highly recommend uh, National Geographic. Yeah. So these are some of the charts in relationship to, uh, uh, and I'm not, not going to do them justice because there's too much detail just to, to highlight that uh, two thirds of the material flow through the economy is waste. And that comes from uh, a little bit of what we saw at the very beginning and what countries are doing. The majority of countries in the world are not doing anything. There's only 25 countries that were featured in, on that chart. And the, of those, uh, you know, the U.S. was near the bottom and they were at 35 percent right in that uh, range of two thirds being waste, unfortunately, at this point in time. Plastic is, is a critical factor, and, and unfortunately, the way plastic is handled by individuals, especially uh, uh, along shorelines in the way it, or riverfronts or wherever, uh, unfortunately, it gets into the waste system and, and is not handled very effectively. And one of the things I heard here recently is there's enough plastic going into our waterways that on an annual basis, basis, I think it is, you're eating a credit card of plastic, we individuals in the world, unfortunately. Uh, much of that, that, I, that my again? understanding, what we are eating uh, because of the amount of plastic that is going into our water and our um, systems in some way or another, uh, we're eating a, a credit card every year. Of, of the, these would be microplastics that get into our food, presumably, or yes, what? In some, yep, in some way or another, yeah. A credit card a year. That's yeah. quite a statistic. I hadn't heard that one. <laughs> I, I come across that one here recently. I don't have it in here specifically. It just That's just off the top. So. <laughs> okay. So uh, you know, waste to energy, uh, this particular location, they uh, are definitely doing an excellent job and all that um, uh, materials. In this case here, it's uh, methane. I believe that's been captured in uh, their hill. They built a ski hill and that's continuing to be used as a ski hill and they continue to generate electricity through that. You, you took us to uh, to our own. Uh, um, yeah, I, I do have that on coming up, Richard. You do. Good, I, good. So I'll definitely that, we'll touch on that. Good, yeah. excellent. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, that's a consideration as far as that particular hill and a little bit more detail about uh, what it's been doing. And it's not only used for skiing, it's of course used for hiking and running and so on. It's right in the middle of a city. Uh, this particular location, I actually physically uh, worked for, well, I worked for a company with one of our locations down in Tucson. Uh, so I've driven right past this particular location with these airline, air, airplanes. And there's 3,300 uh, 3, of them decommissioned and they continue to use the parts for those basically. And they recycle them. They of course selected Tucson because of uh, reduced humidity and reduces the corrosion. And it's nicknamed the, the, the boneyard of course. So. 
tires, uh, uh, recycled tires. I, I, I come across something that uh, here in the last couple of years. So uh, recycling tires, I think it is a great idea, it, but it's what do you recycle it for or to? Uh, in, in this case here, they're, they're doing a really good job. In the case of um, the US, there is a strong move to put recycled tires into playgrounds and underneath AstroTurf. Uh, various uh, communities across the country are adamantly against it, uh, the individuals. Uh, on the other hand, it's very cost effective to do it, uh, and, but there's challenges with potential off-gassing uh, that hasn't been studied well enough, but some people say that it's a problem, especially with AstroTurf. Uh, and, and there's other alternatives that they're now looking. Uh, we have a couple of playgrounds, unfortunately, in uh, the town of Middleton that have the um, uh, rubber mulch. Uh, it's great for safety as far as a kid falling off one of the uh, uh, playground uh, items that they might be uh, going on uh, off the swing or whatever. Uh, so it, uh, it was recommended back in 2015 by the US government that that was one of the best solutions for playgrounds rather than wood chips or pea gravel that they used years ago when I was growing up. Uh, it's now come back and said, well, it might be the best thing, but they, it's taken over five years and they still haven't firmed up over, yeah, well over five years. Uh, they still haven't firmed up, uh, with the best solution, unfortunately. Uh, I would not recommend it using used tires and playgrounds. We're in the process in the town in the middle of removing them and going back to the appropriate wood chips. Uh, this picture is, uh, growing things inside. Uh, cause more and more, uh, let's say, um, land that was, uh, is being used for uh, farming is becoming less and less because we continue to grow as cities into those areas. Uh, uh, the, the town of Middleton, I'll go off on a little bit of a tangent here, originally was six by six square miles, uh, originally, but uh, when the state was founded as a, uh, a state in the United, uh, uh, one of the United States, 50, uh, 50 states. In any case, we now are six miles long, but as little as a mile going east to west, I think no more than two miles because both Middleton and Madison have grown out into that. And if you look in our area, the number of, uh, uh, developments that are going on currently, it is significant to say the least on the west side of Madison. So, uh, so looking at the time, I, 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 I won't go into this particular uh, uh, audio. Uh, it's a, an excellent audio. Again, I will send, I send Richard a PowerPoint and you could click on it and listen to it if you're interested. Uh, on that particular uh, website, uh, and it goes on for about 25 minutes, and it talks about uh, what happened uh, with uh, recycling, and how it began out of New York and the mafia, and how the EPA got involved with it. Uh, it uh, was in the 1980s. Uh, it's an interesting story, and there's no doubt about it. It's uh, uh, an unusual story, to say the least, about this uh, barge uh, with garbage on it and the six mile uh, journey it took uh, and was an epic mess. So the next thing is there is a second uh, portion to that uh, uh, podcast. It is, I would suggest you somewhat negative in nature associated with plastic specific and the challenges and what's happening in China. And uh, that, that's the particular, there's a lot better things going on with plastics as we both heard what, from the university and what uh, uh, Palatari is doing here locally, of course. A so. couple of questions sure. are coming in. If you, are, is that okay? Oh, yes, definitely. Okay. Um, Mike Green asks, to what extent is the U.S. still dumping into the oceans? And I don't know what, what you have to answer that, uh, Tony, but I'll, I'll make a quick stab. Sure. I, I, I looked at the rivers of the world and the, and the worst, 10 worst polluting rivers were all in Southeast Asia, most of them in India. 
Yes. I don't, I don't think any American river is ranked in the top 10. It's not a very good answer to your question. Do you have any other thoughts, Tony? No, I, I could say that uh, through the EPA and the controls that they have put in place, and in some cases uh, relinquished to the DNR in certain, some states, uh, I believe they're doing a much better job of controlling the waste that used to go into our, our streams. Uh, but I know and that's, that goes back to the uh, uh, Clean Water Act right. uh, that was passed years ago, of course, uh, interestingly Nixon. enough, you know, with Nixon yeah, yeah. signing it. Uh, yeah. One of the only and best things he ever did, that's for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. here's, a, here's another one. I don't mean to cut you off, but we should probably that's go right. through these things fairly quickly. Uh, Alan uh, uh, asks, here in Illinois, one can purchase state-approved playground wood chips, playground in quotes, that are tumbled smooth. I have used them in a children's garden. The cost is high, but they're very nice. Just a comment. Yeah, and, and we, uh, we now buy uh, and had bought previously certified wood chips in the town of Middleton, where I, I live. Uh, and uh, only because of the strong recommendation by the U.S. government back in 2015, okay, did they go to those uh, tire chips, and they're they're supposed to be certified also. But I, I my impression is that it's still not the right thing for our kids to be playing it. So. Yeah, in in the the Crane Foundation in Baraboo, they chose to use uh, special spherical glass particles that would allow filtration of the water through the pads and not uh, contribute so much to erosion off to the yeah. sides of the trails. Yeah. Unfortunately, those, those uh, uh, smooth glass pebbles um, didn't last and had to be replaced after about two years. Oh, interesting. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, our paths, uh, more often limestone is generally the recommended approach towards uh, uh, paths of that nature. So. Yeah. Let's see. Um, So yeah, two-part podcast. Like I say, it's uh, quite negative associated with it, and that's the second one. Uh, Madison and it. I'm just looking at our time. It's eleven o'clock. Yeah. So, uh, any other questions right now? If not, I'm gonna. No, this is a, 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 a six-minute video, so it'll take a little bit of time to get through it. Also. Okay. See if it works. All right. So recycling started in Madison in 1968. The American Paper Institute had approached the U.S. Forest Products Lab, which happens to be here in Madison, to try to figure out a way to recycle newspaper. Then together, they approached the city of Madison, and we were able to start a newspaper recycling program. Well, recycling was, was pretty minimal throughout the whole country, but Madison was actually the leader in the entire United States. You know, if somebody else had asked me what spurred recycling, I would have said Earth Day in 1970 that Gaylord Nelson from Wisconsin really pushed. And yet when you think about it, this was two years before Earth Day. So Madison was way ahead of the curve. The American Paper Institute was looking for a new source of raw materials rather than just cutting down more trees to make more paper. For industry, I would say the most important reason to recycle is a new source of raw materials. Instead of cutting down a tree, you recycle a ton of paper, that's like 17 trees. And it has already been processed, so the processing of that back into paper is much less energy intensive much less costly than cutting down trees. When I came into this business, I was a tree hugger. Now I'm an international commodity broker because that's really what it boils down to. If somebody can't make something out of your recycling, then it's not recycling. You can't do anything with it. Not to save trees, not to save resources or anything else. It was able to make money. We could collect it for $5 a ton and sell it for 10. ka -ching. I started on a trash truck, on the rear loader, as a seasonal, and doing brush. Yeah, we went from no recycling to speak of besides newspapers and metals, to recycling all plastics, cardboard, everything. The big push came, I think, in 
around 1989 when Dane County banned yard waste in order to save landfill space. And so that got Madison thinking even more about where are we gonna go from here? What else can we recycle? And then that led us into recycling in 91 of uh, curbside uh, commingled recycling. We were one of the first programs in the country to do that in 1991. It snowballed to one of the best uh, recycling programs in the country. I should comment, I was living in uh, Ripon, Wisconsin in, uh, well, from 1979 to 1990. Uh, and that's where our, our young family grew up at that point in time, our two daughters. In any case, uh, the neighbor right behind us, great guy to say the least, Bill Besh, uh, he was an engineer and uh, was very active with the community, uh, along with myself. In any case, he came up with the idea of recycling and uh, at that point in time, uh, he, he did the recycling, but he, he burned the newspapers. That was the approach at that point in time, uh, in Ripon at least. Uh, but all the other materials, he was able to find sources for it. Uh, most of the materials, I'd say, that were in the recycle. But that recycle program was you had to put the items in each individual container. Brown glass had to go in one container, clear glass in another, paper in another, so on and so on as far as the sorting was concerned. But it, that was rolled out, and like I say, in the 1990s, uh, 1980s. The more we offered, the more they wanted to partake. And uh, basically, I think the city of Madison residents are the ones that forced us to go into more and more recycling. So there was a big change with the workforce as well as the public on recycling, what they do with it, what they can and what they can't recycle. Um, and with the employees, we had to hire another 15, 16 employees to, to do the recycling. One of the things that we as Dane County were very lucky about, and in fact other counties were very lucky about, is that the city of Madison spent a great deal of time and effort on education programs. And the recycling manager at that time for the city of Madison was George Streckman. And George Streckman had a very wonderful rapport with the public. He designed some extraordinarily innovative educational uh, materials, advertisements on the TV. I would go to statewide conferences and when the topic turned to education, some of the communities around Dane County would say, we don't need to educate our, our public. We get Madison TV and George Streckman does it for us for free. <laughs> uh, it was shameless. <laughs> Really shameless. Yeah, so in 2005, there was another big change of recycling in Madison. We went to what's called automated collection. So our one operator now can drive a special truck to each stop and then just use this robot arm that he can extend from the truck, grab a cart, and then dump it into the vehicle rather than having to hop out and collect each stop by hand. Workers' Comp was real high for streets because we lifted everything by hand. When we went to automate it, Workers' Comp went down because everything was put into a cart. Um, we were able to recycle more materials um, thanks to George Dreckman, the recycling coordinator back in 2005. Uh, he found markets for us. You know, we, we do six, 16, 17 different things that are recycled before I left, which was amazing because when I started, you only recycled maybe two. So the one thing I would say to the public about recycling is make certain you stay up to date with the rules because as products change in our lives, the recycling rules change with them. The, the biggest message that I would say is recycling is not trash. These are raw materials for industry. They need quality material. Stick to the instructions. Recycle what we tell you to recycle. It's so big right now, uh, and it's been big all along. When you put the wrong things in the recycling, it still goes to the landfill. I think the biggest thing is people need to know what they can recycle, and they should recycle. There's. A lot of people that throw things away that shouldn't be thrown away. And the landfills are filling up, and we have to recycle and keep that stuff out of landfills. I wish they would recycle more. Realize that still probably half the material they're putting into uh, their trash could be recycled. So recycling is a global commodity. 
and it will ebb and flow over time. There'll be times where there's a lot of money in the system and times when there's less, but we're just gonna keep recycling though because it's the right thing to do. So that, that's a little bit more about it. Madison. We'll be we, uh, continuing on and looking at several other things associated with what's available here locally. I, I wanted to just comment on George sure. Beckman. We had him come to one of our classes quite a few years ago. We happened to have a class in the Middleton Library. Well, he came and he had us in stitches. He's a wonderful speaker, great well, sense of humor. And uh, so those things that we just saw are uh, true to a real pioneer, very innovative and educational, it's great. Yep, no doubt about it. So yeah, depending on where you're located, uh, and I'll be focusing on Palatary specifically, but depending on where you're located, um, you wanna check the website of that particular carrier. Most, I, I should, much of the Madison area is Palatary has taken over, so. So, one of the key elements here is um, uh, re the recent uh, study done in 2019, I think it was, uh, uh, DNR of landfills. And uh, it was throughout the state. They went to the various, uh, various landfills. I don't know that every landfill, but many of the landfills. Uh, the report goes into more depth. I didn't read the whole report. I just came across this one here recently. In any case, the, the area that I'm focusing on is that 30 30.4% of the materials is organics. Uh, and the majority of that, almost all of that organics could be uh, handled more effectively uh, through a compost approach. So that's one of the things I wanna to touch on. So, uh, problematic plastics uh, is, is a real challenge also. Uh, there's uh, certain materials that you just can't handle. And, and, What's amazing to me is that there's so much paper that still gets into it. When yeah. most people know that you should be recycling paper. Yeah. Uh, plastic is a little bit more challenging, of course. And again, uh, the links that I put together, you'd be able to go out and look at that particular uh, indication exactly what, what's behind that particular report. So. So uh, local pick pickup compost service, there is, uh, Madison, my understanding is they tried uh, street side composting for a period of time. And for whatever reason, I, my impression is it did not work. If anybody out there knows that you get uh, composting through Madison, not uh, other than the service, uh, I'd be interested in hearing about it. But right now, my understanding is, is there's a third party out there the name of that particular uh, uh, company is curbsidecomposter.com. And for $7 a week, you can take your food waste and put it into that uh, container that you see on the left side picture there. And they then take it and uh, uh, actually go through a process of recycling that. Here is another approach. This happens to be a picture on the left-hand side of our backyard. Uh, what you see there is a taken recently. And of course, uh, autumn is now fall and all the leaves are continuing to fall off our trees. Uh, the majority of those leaves I uh, pick up, put into a compost bin different than the one that you see down below on the left-hand side. But eventually they get into the uh, bin that you see on the right-hand side and that's a four by four, uh, about four feet high, a little, maybe a little less than four feet high, but it piles up. Uh, the can that you see in the background there, this can here is what we put our compost in in the house. And basically that goes through a couple month process, definitely over the year. And the uh, uh, materials that come out of here, out of this area, go into these beds. We have seven beds where we have uh, organic uh, garden that we grow. Uh, in addition, there's blueberry bushes and honeyberry bushes around that particular garden, apple trees in the back here. So, 
So composting, if kept locally, is very effective. If not, use a third-party service. And I sure hope somewhere along the lines that Dane County, which I think it'll be touched on a little bit later, will evolve that program at some point in time. So I do know from uh, uh, reading articles that uh, the city of uh, San Francisco does an excellent job of composting and it's mandatory and there's serious fines if you don't do it properly. Uh, and my daughter happens to live in one of the suburbs of uh, uh, Madison. They're able to take their, uh, their waste and they just put it into their leaves and they pick up the uh, food waste with the leaves on a routine basis along with grass clippings and other things of that nature, which I also think would be an excellent approach. Okay, uh, let's see if this one is the one I think it is. Habitat for pollinators. The biogas produced by the landfill contains methane, the same gas that makes up the natural gas used to heat your home. This biogas is collected and processed into renewable natural gas at our state-of-the-art facility. From there, it feeds into an interstate pipeline and is used as renewable vehicle fuel, offsetting carbon emissions. So we visited the, the landfill going back several years ago. Uh, they were in the process of changing over. Uh, they now service all of the um, trucks as far as garbage trucks and other vehicles that have been converted to use um, um, methane or natural gas uh, to actually uh, power those vehicles. Uh, when we went out there, they were giving it to uh, Madison Gas and Electric, I believe, or into the gas pipes that were being used as far as uh, uh, anybody that was using gas out of their homes, of course. Um, so they've changed that. They found it more cost effective for various reasons, uh, and it's working out well as far as I understand. An offloading station allows other biogas producers, like Wisconsin Dairy Farms, to access the pipeline and renewable energy markets as well. The Department of Waste and Renewables also operates Dane County's Clean Sweep. Here, we collect household hazardous waste to keep toxic chemicals and electronics out of our landfill and environment. At Clean Sweep... Now, Clean Sweep is available definitely at uh, the uh, Dane County landfill. It is also offered at times across the community. I think here in the next couple of weeks, it'll be uh, offered in Fitchburg. Uh, anybody in the Madis Madison area is welcome to come to that particular location and get rid of, rid of some of the items that should not go into the landfill and are definitely very challenging, paints and solvents and other things of that nature, along with uh, electronic equipment, I believe. Sweep's product exchange room, you can find usable materials, like paint, to take home with you at no charge. Each day, we divert an additional 350 tons of material for recycling or beneficial reuse. The primary materials accepted on site for recycling include construction and demolition debris, tires, and shingles. We see other now, what they touched on there, of course, is, is what's being recycled at the uh, Dane County landfill because of the massive size of it. What goes into your um, uh, recycled bin at your, uh, that you put at your curbside, that's completely different. Although you saw a palletary truck there because palletary not only handles the, the recycle stuff, of course, it handles the garbage too. Other opportunities for innovation and waste diversion as our existing landfill gets near capacity. Our vision for the future includes additional infrastructure for on-site reuse and recycling and alternative options for management of organics and food waste, such as digestion or composting. We want to provide opportunities and space for research and new waste management technologies to emerge. Surrounding green space will be utilized for recreation and environmental education. Together, we look forward to advancing towards a circular economy where waste and raw materials are minimized through reuse and recycling. After all, so definitely uh, uh, the key comment there is circular uh, economy. How do you continue to reuse those things that we uh, have uh, rather than just consuming them? Uh, but the other key element that came out of uh, this particular video, and we heard it years ago, the Dane County landfill is coming to completion. That location is been being maxed out. 
they've done just about everything they can. And eventually here in the next year or two, I don't, I don't know the exact timeline, uh, that particular location will be closed off. And my impression is, is the location they are creating will handle different items in different ways, much better than the current landfill. And that's something that's, that's being rolled out at this point in time is my impression. Uh, and it might be interesting at some point in time to take a visit to that particular location. Wrong. Waste is just resources in the wrong places. So it's like a seven story building made out of garbage. John Welch, I'm the director of the Dane County Department of Waste and Renewables. So on a typical day, we'll get anywhere from 300 to 400 customers or trucks a day bringing in waste. Uh, we that. will well, receive about 1,200 tons of waste every day. In addition to that, we'll receive another three to four. So that's a more detailed uh, video, uh, if I remember correctly. Although it only is a minute long, I, I, I still will stop it at this point. Okay, are you ready for some more questions? Oh, yes, go ahead. Good, there are a few more here. Um, Alan uh, Pentagoff says, we should encourage the waste haulers to convert to EV power for their trucks. The start-stop cycle is very friendly to EV power, electric vehicle power. Burning diesel to pick up your recyclables is a negative. So I think that's true, except where we can use uh, um, in the, the uh, actual methane that's generated from the waste. Um, but otherwise, I think that's true that um, EV power is it's a very good way to use it, especially if the trucks have regen uh, in their stop and start cycle. Yes. Regenerating yeah. capacity. Mike has a comment on composting, a question. Any idea how to passively collect seeds from exotic and invasive plants? And my knowledge, of that uh, is limited, but I think uh, the um, um, that farm. I'm thinking. Think what's what's the farm where you volunteered? Uh, Pope Farms. Pope Farms. Yeah, they have. Thank you. They have classes in that um, periodically. Do you have any other suggestions? It, I, I would. Um, there are probably videos out there on how to do it. I have not looked at one personally. Yeah. Um, I, I believe. Uh, even that the Pope Farm uh, Conservancy, the Friends of Pope Farm, yeah. uh, I believe there might be a link on their uh, education that, that talks about that, where they may have video at some point in time. I, 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 I'm, I may have misspoke on that one. I, I, I'm not positive. On it. I know they welcome volunteers to come and help out, and you can yes, and, and it's good learning experience. Yes. Yeah. 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 So uh, I haven't. And they done do that, that every fall. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And uh, it might be a little distance from you, Mike, but uh, um, Pope Farm will be a good source. Sure. Uh, next question, are donation centers such as Goodwill, Salvation Army and other locals, thrift shops knowledgeable and how to recycle their unwanted materials? I'm sure some get many borderline materials. This yeah. is from Lou Harnish. I, I don't know, I think one would have to ask those uh, Goodwill and Salvation Army places. I imagine that they're pretty, um, yeah, pretty knowledgeable and careful about it. Any thoughts, Tony? Yeah, yeah definitely as far as uh, uh, any furniture, any clothing item, old shoes, things of that nature. Uh, uh, there's, um, well, I'm trying to think of the, um, uh, the location that's over on Odana Road that uh, accepts uh, old appliances, uh, takes doors, things of that nature, uh, and does a real good job. Uh, yes, I'm trying to think of the name of it too. Yeah, um, it's involved with uh, Jimmy Carter's uh, uh, nonprofit organization, uh, Habitat for Humanity. Yes. Uh, it's one of those, uh, 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 let's say, storefront locations where people are able to take items that are of a, a building nature more often than not, or a major appliance or something like that, that still has good life, uh, and they'll, they'll, they'll resell that particular item. Uh, goodwill, uh, years ago, there were si some of the Goodwill sites that actually took any rags or whatever, anything at all, and would make them into rags or other materials. 
my impression is they don't that they, they, they like to have items that it still have some life uh, and use in them though. Um, okay. so, anything else? Yeah. Yeah. Mike Green, is the conversion of organic materials to methane, such as landfills, is it being rethought? Um, I, I suppose he's he's asking, is it is it being improved or is it not uh, profitable? What, what are the latest uh, updates on on conversion of materials to methane at, uh, at landfills? So my, my impression is, is that they're trying to separate that compost and use it in a different approach, put it back into the land and, and you, I mean, that, that, that food waste. Uh, I don't know enough detail as far as Madison and its approach, uh, Dane County and the Dane County, the, the new Dane County landfill, how they will accommodate that. But that's my impression. That's a better use than the methane, off guessing. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Rickers uh, asks, will um, uh, a PDF of all these videos and websites be made available to us? I yes, I will. I'll, I'll, link I'll, make, I, I'll send that PDF. off to you, Richard, later this week. Okay. And Doug Edwards uh, has the word restore. Um, you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think he the re, that that's the name of the, of the business. It's called Restore. Okay. 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 Um, Don asks or makes a point. Typically, regulation and taxation are government solutions to bad aspects of the economy. Why can't we significantly tax non-recyclable plastic production? Production. <laughs> that's a, a good theory. Um, it shows. Sure yeah, I would agree with them. Another concept is, is of course, uh, the, the uh, taxing of carbon uh, with the um, move by CCL to do a better job of capturing yeah. the, 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 the pollutant as it's coming out of the ground. Right, indeed. At the source is a good way. Yes. And I think uh, what we should do also is encourage businesses to use less plastic uh, in, their, uh, in their produce. I purposely go to other smaller hardware stores instead of uh, Menards, because Menards, I find uh, everything's wrapped up in plastic, difficult yeah. to get off without cutting yourself and, and you get end up buying stuff that you don't want as opposed to individually shopping at a smaller hardware. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, it's the lowest cost of packaging. I, yeah. I worked with a, a company up in the Twin Cities that was a cardboard company that was working with Walmart, where Walmart had a real strong focus. So going back 10, 15 years ago now, um, that, that, that particular company was doing a lot with Walmart to uh, produce as much packaging in cardboard rather than with plastics. Yeah. Uh, and uh, it, it looked very promising. And they, they were getting some additional business because of the work they were doing at the time. Because cardboard is a lot more recyclable, that's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. A lot easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me click on this one. Okay. Hey, everybody. Stop clicking around. I am in the woods uh, with some water going in the background near my house. And in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to show you how to. Have you ever wondered what happens to your recyclables after they're collected from your home or business? Please enjoy watching how Pelletary Waste Systems separates and prepares your recyclables so they can be shipped to end users to be made into new products. As recycling trucks arrive at Kip Street Station. So our original plan for this day was to go to the Kip Street Station and we would have observed this. They would have showed us a couple more videos. They would have handed out some additional information, um, all of which I believe is on, on the website. Uh, and this is the closest we get to actually seeing the facility in operation. So. They back into the facility and unload recyclable material onto the tipping floor. The loader then piles up the recycling. When the system needs more material to sort, the loader will grab from the pile and load it into the first piece of equipment, the metering bin. The metering bin's function is to produce a constant flow of material, which is essential to allow the sorting equipment to function properly. After the material is metered, it goes up the first conveyor and drops onto the pre-sort station. At the pre-sort station, we have several quality control people who are pulling out recyclable metal objects like pots, pans, and toasters. They're also pulling out recyclable bags of shredded paper. While pulling out these good recyclables, 
That, that was an interesting one that I did not know of until I watched the website. And by the way, Palatari does not do the town of Middleton now. They just got the contract starting in, in January to do it. And many of the municipalities around the community that have, have used, uh, are using Pelletary. So, uh, but small appliances, toasters, and a few other things, they do a good job of capturing those and, and, selling, and, and selling that uh, recycled uh, uh, small appliance in, a, in a, my impression, a very effective manner. Recyclables, they're also looking for material that is not supposed to be in the recycling. Ropes, water hoses, large non-bottle plastics, trash, diapers, loose plastic bags, and clothing are sometimes found in the recycling, but are not recyclable in this system. Contaminants will often cause good recyclables to become unrecyclable, and that material will go to the landfill. It's very important to only put approved materials into your recycling container so that good recyclables are not contaminated. As material leaves the pre-sort station, it goes up another conveyor and drops into the old corrugated cardboard, or OCC screen. As the cardboard moves across the screen, it will be touching multiple disks, allowing it to stay on top of the screen and move forward. Smaller recyclables will fall between these disks, drop down, and move on to the next piece of equipment. Under the OCC screen is a debris roll screen, which acts like a glass breaker and breaks bottled glass into quarter-sized pieces. The broken glass then falls through the debris roll screen and goes into a glass cleanup system that removes pieces of metal and other small non-glass items. After the glass and cardboard is removed, the recyclables move on to the newspaper screen. The newspaper screen uses the same concept as the OCC screen, the steep angle uses gravity to force three-dimensional objects like detergent bottles to bounce backwards and off the screen, while two-dimensional newspaper rides up and over. The third and final screen is the polishing screen. Small papers move up and over the screen onto the paper sorting platform. Gravity will cause three-dimensional materials to bounce backwards and off the back of the screen where they're conveyed onto the next process. Just after the polishing screen, we have a quality control optical sorting machine. This equipment uses light and magnets to identify any metal or plastic material that is flattened enough to act like a piece of paper and remain in the paper stream. Once this material is identified, it is hit with a shot of air and removed from the paper stream so that it can go on to be sorted with all the other plastic and metals. At this point, we have a quality control station to look for any paper that has gotten through the screens. Generally, this would be three-dimensional paper products like phone books, balled-up paper, or juice and milk cartons. These materials are pulled and sorted. Now that all papers have been sorted out of the recyclables, they go to the paper platform. There are several stations where people are removing contaminants, such as plastic films or trash from the paper. By the time the paper gets to the end of the conveyor, it will meet the paper mill's specifications. After all the paper products and glass have been removed and sorted, all that's left in the system is plastics and metals and other non-recyclable materials. A magnet removes all of the tin and steel cans. A second magnet system, called an eddy current, removes the aluminum cans. Since aluminum doesn't stick to a magnet like tin or steel, this piece of equipment spins a magnet extremely fast, and this produces a magnetic field that repels the aluminum cans, causing them to jump off the conveyor and onto their own storage area. After the metals have been removed, all that is left is number one through number seven plastic bottles and trash that hasn't already been pulled out of the system. These bottles go on to our plastic sorting platform where robotic arms use artificial intelligence to target and pull number two plastics like milk jugs, laundry detergent jugs, and shampoo bottles. The bottles that remain on the line go to the optical sorter. This machine shoots a ray of light into the plastic and reads how the light reflects back. A computer analyzes the light and determines if the plastic bottle is a number one plastic or a number three to seven plastic bottle. The optic system will then shoot a perfectly controlled blast of air at the bottle, which directs it to either the number one plastic storage area or the number three to number seven plastic storage area. Non-plastic material does not have air shot at it and falls onto the residue conveyor, which leads to the trash. Before this material goes in the trash, we have our final quality control station. 
The robotic arm uses the same artificial intelligence system and is responsible for pulling out any recyclable material that was not properly sorted. Once material is sorted, it's stored in bunkers. The sorted material gets pushed onto a conveyor that goes into the baler. The baler will compact the loose material into a large brick-like bale that uses metal strapping wire to hold it together. These bales are stored in a storage area and ready to be shipped to an end user. A majority of our paper and cardboard goes to paper mills in Wisconsin and Indiana, where it is made into new paper or cardboard products. Tin and steel cans go to local metal recycling companies and are eventually melted down to make new metal products. Aluminum cans are melted down to make new aluminum cans. Our plastics go to processors that shred the material into flakes, which are used to make new plastic bottles or other plastic products like plastic lumber, landscape edging, and drainage tiles. The glass gets color sorted and melted down to make new glass products. Thank you for watching how Pelletary Waste System sorts and prepares your recyclables to be shipped to manufacturers so they can be made into new products. Remember to please keep contaminants out of your recycling so they don't contaminate the good recyclables. Tony, that was great. Yeah. That's well, the best one you've shown yet. I think it's just like going there. The weight. It's probably even it's better because you get a much closer look at all those different things. I have to finish this. No time to die. Really PG-13. This is a bag of premium organic oil. That's the unfortunate thing about uh, using uh, YouTube. <laughs> right. It'll continue on if you don't cancel it out or pause yeah. it. So, right. Sorry about that. Yeah, it, it did, is uh, uh, just like being there. In that particular been, uh, site, they sorry. have done an excellent job as far as uh, automating that process. They still need people, of course, uh, to handle much of the materials, but uh, that automated process makes it a lot cleaner as far as what's coming yeah. out at the end. Now, can you send that link to me in particular? Yep, sure. That That is a great one. Star that one, because I think that's worth passing around to family and friends. Uh, it's so informative, incredible. Yep. Yeah. Now, uh, let, let me go on to the next one. I, I, I see I don't have still have time. Yep. Uh, so the, the this particular and I don't have a link actually. Oops, sorry, bear bear with me there. This is going to their website at this point in time, and it actually has twenty different uh, videos uh, touching on uh, the various aspects and what you should be doing. You know what happens with the recycle. Uh, I tell you, don't put bags. You know. Uh, Tell you not to put uh, what we call it, uh, batteries or electronics in there. It does a real good job of educating, I'd say. Uh, each one of them, uh, the video is anywhere from a minute, uh, maybe two minutes long, uh, very specific. So Okay, great. We're, got, we're getting lots of kudos. Uh, people are writing in. That was fascinating and kudos, etc. cetera. Um, uh, Mike says, I didn't see in Tony's video how contaminations cause the throwing out of legitimate plastics. So one of the key elements is uh, if um, the, the item has not been separated properly, I think like a, uh, when you get a, a package item that has a, not an envelope, but a package item that has a window in it and uh, has cardboard uh, around it, but the window is such that it's the part of the plastic and the, and the cardboard, they don't have an easy way of separating that. So that, that's thrown out. Uh, so it's recommended that you separate that. Take the plastic uh, <laughs> cover, uh, the, the plastic opening off and then recycle the cardboard. Okay. Uh, the other, of course, is food waste. If there's food in any of those containers, uh, uh, that that causes a problem, and my impression is is they they attempt to, to to weed that out. They I don't believe they'd wash that or do anything at that particular site. 
Uh, so that's that I think is another factor. And then there's other uh, unfortunate materials that are at the end of that cycle there that are not handled. And some of it at the beginning of the cycle where they take them out, hoses or whatever that shouldn't be recycled in that way. So. Good. There's another question. Are recycled plastics made into recyclable plastics? That's an interesting adjective, recyclable yeah. plastic. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure of the frequency and how it is. Although the yeah. video that we saw from UW, okay, and what they're doing in research, yes, that's a de that, my impression is that's a definite if they can get that to be perfected at a cost-effective manner. I think uh, it depends. Re re recycling, I don't know how they determine what, I think eventually that, that bottle, if it's a recycled bottle, might have to be used some other way, but I don't know that for a fact. Yeah, I think sometimes it can only be recycled recycled once to another plastic, and that's the end the end use. Yeah. But but there may be some exceptions. Yeah. yeah, hopefully they'll find out more and be able to do more with uh, with the process that they're developing in the lab. So. Well, I think it's fascinating. I. I when I used to live in Westchester County before I moved to Madison, and we used to sort out of the different colored glass uh, bottles, yes, yep. and cans, and aluminum, and so on. Uh, but we didn't do paper, as I recall. And uh, so it was primitive, and it was really impressing, impressive when we came to Madison uh, to see how everyone was doing it. Um, we had to volunteer to it every second, every couple of Saturday mornings. We and the neighbors would get together and drive down to the ocean front and. <laughs> And that's where we had these big bins put up. But huh. uh, so Madison, I, I, I thought it was an evolution across the country, but I'm seeing from this that, that we are a pretty special town. Yes, and, we are. Yeah, many ways. Yeah. It's nice to see something positive also. Yeah. Um, we, we see so much negative in, um, in our lecture material. Uh, this was, uh, uh, although very... Uh, up front in, in the stuff that gets recycled, it, it, it's, uh, it's very positive that we're able to avoid as much landfill as we do. Yeah, I agree. Uh, uh, touch on batteries uh, because uh, they're somewhat problematic. Rechargeable yes, batteries, please, yes, there's various do. locations around a town that you can uh, recycle those rechargeable batteries. Uh, Madison, uh, even the non-rechargeable batteries, um, they're, um, we call the uh, C and D and um, double A's and triple A's and all those batteries are can be recycled. If you stop over at um, uh, UW Research Park Clinic, uh, as you walk in through the um, automatic doors right on the left-hand side, you definitely are, there's a bin there. You just put them in there. Uh, uh, the only thing that they recommend, of course, with a uh, the uh, D size, not D, uh, the nine volt batteries. Yeah. that you put tape across that because if it, it could short out a nine volt battery. Nine volt, these are the rectangular ones? Yeah, the rectangular ones it, where the positive and negative are on one side of the battery. Yeah, put tape over this. Put tape over it, yeah. Okay. Electronics, uh, as mentioned, Peltier uh, will take some small appliances, but uh, many of the items, uh, computers, TVs, uh, various other things, Best Buy will take them. Uh, and then the, uh, uh, when they, periodically they'll have electronics recycling in, in various communities around town. But definitely don't throw them in the garbage. Okay. Much of that material, uh, especially computers is, uh, and, and cell phones, have some very precious materials. Indeed. So if I think this is only about, yeah, it's two minutes and 30 seconds. I'm going to show it if that's okay. Yeah. There's so much bad news about our planet, it's so warm. Truth is, I've given up. This is the story of a simple solution, a way to heal our planet. The solution is right under our feet, and it's as old as dirt. All of our 
our soils that are under chemical conventional agriculture are almost completely devoid of microorganisms. Modern agriculture was not designed for the betterment of the soil. Fossil fuels are by no means the only thing that is causing climate change. When we damage soils, carbon goes back to the atmosphere. But when we destroy soil, it releases carbon dioxide. Biosequestration is using plants, trees, and techniques of grazing and farming to capture carbon and store it in the soil. We can fix a lot of our climate issues to we bring the CO2 down into a living plant and put it back into the soil where it belongs. Plants working with soil microorganisms, it seems too simple. Healthy soils lead to a healthy plant. Healthy plant, healthy human, healthy climate. There could be a way to eat food that heals the planet. The problem isn't the animal. The problem is where the animals are at. How do we take waste and repurpose and reuse it because it's really not waste? The poop has to stay in the loop. Compost is just one of a suite of soil-based carbon capture solutions. We know how to do it. And if we continue to scale over 30 years, we can reverse global warming. We can get the Earth back to the Garden of Eden that it once was by regeneration. To see biodiversity return to a place that was completely devastated, that gives me hope. Our health and the health of our planet are connected. If you look over here, my neighbor's land that has been chemical fallow, then you look over at our paddocks, you have a diversity of different plant species. Which model do you want your food to be produced from? The answer is pretty simple to me. I'll make you a deal. I won't give up, and neither should you. Very good, Tony. So, yeah, that one, <clears throat> it's, a, uh, it's available. Try there. our new barbecue Cuban sub uh, made goes, with guys. tender pulled pork, Virginia honey ham, sweet and smoky chipotle slaw, and spicy pickle chips. Only at Firehouse Subs. Click the banner to order pickup or delivery. Limited time offer. Participating locations. Sorry about that again. <laughs> like I say, that's whenever you use YouTube, and I should know better that I should pause it at the end rather than kind of cancel out of it. Uh, uh, let's go back here. So, uh, again, it's available on Netflix. And uh, if you go to the, uh, the website, uh, kisstheground.com, that, uh, that website uh, says that you can watch it through Vinmo, uh, which is a third-party service for a dollar. Uh, so that's, that's two approaches towards seeing that movie. I think it's a, a better, more than an hour and a half. It is excellent. I highly recommend that if you, if you have any farmer friends to pass it along to them. It's, it's the way we should be doing farming. And they go into a lot of detail in that movie about it. We should be hearing from Allison Duff in a few weeks and can raise some uh, of these discussions with her during the question period. Very good. So uh, that's all I have at this point in time as far as uh, uh, what I went through and uh, pulling some various things together to, to share with you. Uh, recycling is the key thing and creating a, a circular uh, cycle is, is the right thing for the future. So any other questions? Well, I, I, I personally salute you uh, for giving us great talk, for doing your uh, uh, composting yourself. And um, uh, I'm always pleasantly uh, um, impressed with your talks, Tony, and really appreciate this one uh, very much. Um, getting lots of kudos coming in. Outstanding program, thank you. Well done. Um, so on. So, uh, so I think it was very appreciated by our class, and thank you. Very good. Next week, next week we'll be hearing about uh, uh, Canadian perspectives on nuclear energy, and particularly Ontario, which uh, you heard a couple of weeks ago is exceptional in its uh, efficiency and use of nuclear energy. Uh, they don't have uh, nuclear regulatory commissions up there that are 
blocking things for decades. And uh, I think uh, we can ask lots of good questions to Alexander, to Neil. I mean, he was a speaker here last spring and was uh, uh, very, very much appreciated too. So I look forward to seeing you all then. Meanwhile, have a good week. My, my uh, uh, parting thought is in uh, 15 minutes, I'm gonna get a new furnace installed. My old one was beyond uh, was leaking carbon monoxide and beyond repair. And uh, they promised me that they would recycle everything that comes out of the old furnace. So <laughs> with, your, with your talk in mind, Tony, I made sure of that. <laughs> Very good. So you guys uh, have a good uh, Canadian Thanksgiving, uh, Independent uh, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day and, and Columbus Day. We'll see you next week. Bye now. Okay, bye-bye. And thank you for your support, uh, uh, Stephanie. You're welcome, Richard. Great presentation. Thank you so much. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm going to watch that one again with my husband. <laughs> Maybe with my daughter. Yeah. Great so. Okay, I'm glad that was recorded. Yes. Have a good day. Thanks, and you all. Bye bye. Best of best, Tony. Thank you. Thank you.